Uh, you're very welcome to this informal meeting. Um, here uh, with the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre. So uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Owen McGuinness, uh, who will be giving a presentation now. Uh, so I'll just open it to apologies if any members have apologies. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Deborah Erskine. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, anyone else? Uh, it's uh, Councillor Thornton here, uh, Councillor Warrington, and Councillor Smith. Thank you, very, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Thornton. Mary here, Chair. Yes. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Phillips and Councillor Blake. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Garrity. Um, Barry is joining. Grand Barry, have you any apologies or? No, that doesn't mean there won't be a significant number. Any apologies, sorry. Grand, OK. That's grand. Thanks, Barry. Uh, any independents or smaller parties? Uh, Councillor McAleer here. John, yes. uh, just to give an apology for Councillor Keenan. He's still at work, so he's not going to be available this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, um, Emmett. Um, so nobody else. So uh, thank you very much. So as I said, uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Owen McGuinness, uh, and he's going to give us a presentation now. So uh, after that, um, we will be I have questions. So I'll uh, open it up to the floor then after. So uh, I'll pass over to you, uh, Owen. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just going to upload the slides here that people can see them as I'm going through. Um, and so can people see that now? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. I'm just going to, I'll probably um, try and run through this quickly enough just to allow plenty of time for discussion. Um, so I suppose when I'm beginning, I've been doing a very, uh, you know, a variation on, on this presentation for the last couple of weeks in different kind of local governments, uh, local councils across the North. Um, and I, I think key questions that people really come back to, or there's probably four key questions, I guess, that I'll try and cover in this. I, I suppose the first thing is how deep the economic impact of COVID-19 might be in in general and then, you know, at a local level as well. The, the second one really applied to that is, you know, where, where might we feel it most in terms of places and sectors and so on, or we're going to likely feel it more in employment or in economic output, those types of questions. And then how long, I suppose, what's now becoming sort of um, a bigger question is how long might it be before we recover to the previous peak if we take the end of 2019 as at the peak time when things started to, um, you know, coronavirus began to sort of impact in the first quarter of 2020. So if we kind of take the end of 2019 as the previous peak, how long might it take us to get back there? And really finally, I suppose there's then there's probably more for the discussions. What can we do um, to try and make that recovery as quick as possible um, for you know for Fermanagh uh, and Oma District, but also maybe more more generally than that. So those are, those are probably the four questions I'll try and cover as best I can in the presentation, and then open it up to questions at that point. So really, when you're thinking about um, COVID, there's a sort of a broad perspective around the, around the um, how the impacts of COVID. Uh, the coronavirus actually work out uh, how the economic impacts of that and there's probably three ways um you know how it kind of un unravels or over over the period it's the containment really of of um of you know restricting public spaces of quarantining people the movement restrictions and so on that kind of containment is it the primary impact um of it or, or the primary channel of impact then you have you know the the fact that we've Close would largely shut down large parts of the economy or the non-essential parts of the economy. Um, back in March, for you know the best part of sort of six to eight weeks, and in some sectors still, um, there are some sectors still obviously operating under the restrictions around sort of physical distancing, um, and so on. And then you have a the probably the third one, which may be the most influential one in terms of the recovery, more so than the physical distancing or even in the capacity constraints, and that'll be around what will demand look like over the next um, number of months and perhaps even 
into the next year or two. So in other words, what will export demand look like for businesses that are exporting? What will demand look like from tourism, people coming into the country? And what will demand look like locally? What will our high streets look like in terms of um, local domestic demand? I suppose the, the, deep, the depth of the impact then, most, um, most of the kind of assessments are upwards of 6% of an impact on GDP this year. So that's a, that's a sizable, so what you're really looking at, what that means effectively is that in many economies, the, the, the size of the economy will be 6% smaller by the end of 2020 than it was at the end of 2019. Sizable chunk of the economy. If you look at the graph there in front of you, you can see on the far left of that graph, you have the likes of Spain, France, Italy, the UK being among the, the worst hits. Uh, and this kind of looks at two, two ways, a hit, a single hit being the dark blue, and a double hit then a sort of a, a particularly bad second way of being being the double hit in that um the republic is you know, the south is kind of closer to the the six seven percent mark um whereas the uk could be looking around about 12 percent mark there so a significant difference between the two um oecd would tend to look at across a number of companies there and i can come back to that but that six percent plus is likely to be the the worst with large parts of europe badly affected locally or closer to home. Um, what we've began to see in, in terms of the, the PMI indices is that output started to drop as early as February and then very significantly into March and April. And we begin to see a wee bit of a rebound in May and now into June in the latest figures, but still in negative territory. Still, so what you're looking at is economic output is still declining in May and June, but at a short, at a lower rate than it was back then. So that's why you're seeing the, the bounce back up on that. And most, what I was saying there is where we might feel it most, the sectors most at risk, I think we all know at this stage really what those are, a mix of the physical distancing and a mix of the restrictions on movement. So the likes of wholesale, retail, accommodation, hospitality, um, parts of manufacturing, the non-food end of it have been, have been sorely affected. Um, construction now getting back, but still on a sort of reduced capacity um, level, and and other things that have been closed, you know, mothballed really, like arts and leisure. You know, I'm thinking leisure centres, um, gyms, that sort of thing, and those just starting to come back. So those are the jobs, and in if you take that across the north, you're talking about 415,000 jobs potentially at risk within those sectors, and um, the ones that are most likely to be impacted. The early signs then in terms of around unemployment. Now we've just the claimant count figures today, which would show that the numbers in June were down slightly on May, which it's hard to kind of read what that is. It's a small, it's a small enough number. But in general, in right across the council areas, including from Ananoma, you're looking at um rises of between 60 and 120% on this time last year. So significant rise in claimants. Um, and probably a key factor on this is that we now Unfortunately, for those who are already on the claimant count that in January, we now have a kind of queue of people joining them and potentially in front of them having been close closer to the labour market or that. So it could it's one thing to bear in mind, I suppose, the group of people who are already on the claimant count back at the start of the year and what we might be needing to do for them as well as those who have just lost their jobs. So and maybe more to come now with the furlough scheme coming to an end. The furlough scheme inevitably will come to an end. And it's beginning, going to begin to taper now in the autumn, and I think that'll be a time when decisions will be made. There is some talk um, that up to 25% of those jobs currently on furloughed may not return in the short term. Um, that would mean a significant number if we think there's around about 220,000 um, jobs within, the, within Northern Ireland that are furloughed at the moment. If 25% of those were not to come back, or indeed say, take that closer to Fermanagh, if a quarter of the jobs there were not to return, at least in the short term, um, you're looking at potentially another two and a half to three thousand um, people who are currently furloughed, then moving over in towards the claim account or inactivity. So that's a, that's a significant thing to watch now as, as the autumn goes on. Locally, then, um, I just kind of want to talk about two things. We did a bit of work looking at if the impact on um, Northern Ireland as a whole was in around the sort of 11.5% of a drop in GDP, um, which isn't beyond the beyond, I think, for 2020. You're looking at a sort of almost a 12% drop in GDP. So 
So the economy in Fermanagh and Oma could, by the end of 2020, be 12% smaller than it was at the end of 2019. An enormous drop. Um, if you look at it compared even to the previous recession, um, back in sort of looking at 2009, 10, 11, there are small drops for, for those couple of years in GDP, nothing like the estimated drop that you'll see this year. So the, 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 the point about that is it, it um, that kind of can have a huge impact, knock on impact really on employment. And what we're kind of looking at that in, in terms of that is that perhaps up to a third of jobs in the Fermanagh and Oma, jobs that are actually in workplaces in Fermanagh and Oma district are currently kind of at, at either on furlough or, or already have been laid off. So that's what we're kind of looking at for that area. And when we kind of added up the claim and count on the numbers that were on the official numbers from which are more resident based and kind of workplace based, we're not far off the mark there in terms of that risk. And again, I go back to that point about the key question of being how many of those jobs will return off furlough. So I suppose that's the kind of the outline of, of the estimate of the impact as we are in terms of how deep it is, um, where we're feeling it most um, in terms of the sectors, as which I think we know at this point. Um, so around then about how long it might take us to get back and what we can do, just a few kind of thoughts on that. Um, the shape of the recovery is going to be very uncertain. It was the, um, for, the, for the UK a couple of days ago, um, there was a, a number of scenarios released you know, when you're kind of talk, people would talk about V-shaped recoveries or um, Nike-shaped, like swoosh-style recoveries or U-shaped type recoveries. So there's a number of kind of letters or shapes put around that. I think you can kind of see on the graph I put there, the kind of lighter dotted line um, is your, your typical V-shaped recovery, by which the argument is that the, the UK economy or indeed the northern economy or the southern economy would be back to where they were fairly quickly at some stage in early 2021. Now, that's a best case scenario, really, of a, of a recovery within a year to 18 months of the previous peak. More likely, really, than that are the kind of the more the swoosh type recoveries or kind of tick type recoveries um, in that. And that would be looking then at a, an estimate of the economy in the north and, and likewise, really, for Man and Oma, taking four to five years to return to peak in terms of its economic output. Um, that's not untypical. If you think of the last recession um, in, in Fermanagh and Oma district, it took around the six to seven years mark. But in this case, it's a much sharper decline, followed by a kind of a bounce, whereas in the previous time, it was more of a sort of a longer term V that, that you know, or longer term drop that then sort of came up. So um, four to five years doesn't seem beyond the beyond um, for me. The problem I, I suspect this time around and what we're looking at as being different um, and just coming on to that um, is I think the fourth point I would make there, we need to have an understanding this time that a low output may recover um, relatively quickly in comparison to previous recessions. This is an unemployment crisis first and foremost. I think um, we're already looking at rates of unemployment of, of around about 7% in, in many local um, government districts already and higher than that in some places. Um, we would estimate that if things go badly wrong with the furlough scheme, you know, tapering out and people being laid off, 12% will be beyond the beyond. And when you think that generally unemployment will come down at a rate of sort of less than 1% per annum, if you're trying to get back down to the sort of 4 or 5% mark, you can, you can work out the mass there. You're talking perhaps 7, 8 nine years to come back to where we were at the end of last year. So that's a, it's an unemployment crisis first and foremost. And I suppose we, we have to kind of think about it in those terms, particularly when some of the sectors that tend to be good job creators like retail, like tourism um, in your own district as much as mine um, here over in South Town, where they're not likely to drive the recovery, then we need to sort of think about what other jobs might be created, what other um, measures or interventions need to be taken to help with job creation over the next while. I suppose two other things that are different this time around is the, the size of the, the depth of the decline um, is quite different to before. And the second thing, I suppose, is your question there about how government response has so far been unprecedented. I mean, I think if we were to look at the, the, the governments in London or indeed in um, Dublin, you know, we, we wouldn't really have thought that governments would intervene to the level 
that they have in terms of wage subsidies. That was something that, that most people certainly would expect to happen in, in other European countries, but not here close at home. So the government responses to date have been unprecedented, but there's probably a, a pinch point now being reached in terms of um, how long that will that will allow that will be allowed to continue. Um, and, and that's going to be the thing to watch. Um, more locally, I suppose you're then looking at what can we do locally? Is it about accelerating delivery of plans like the growth deal? And the hand in hand of that, some more short term measures around sort of um, town centre regeneration, accelerating things there. Um, certainly lobbying very, very hard for the broadband delivery to be improved um, out to rural areas, I think. Therefore, not only for people working from home, but also and doing calls like this, but also for new enterprises being set up. So there's a, there's a number of 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 things there. Um, I, I think and other things we can maybe discuss in the in the Q and A afterwards. But I, I want to just leave it there to allow the time for discussion, and I'll I can leave that share up, or sorry, I can leave those slides up, chair, or knock it down, depending on yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, Owen. I think you can leave them up. Um, thanks sure. very much for the uh, informative presentation there. Um, it is a big worry for us all about the unemployment. So uh, to see it in figures, it is rather stark. So um, I'd like to invite members if they have any questions, if you could please indicate. Um, Councillor Thompson. And then Councillor Baird. So, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Actually, my hand had went down there, but I, I will uh, thank Dr. McGuinness for his presentation at this time. I'm wondering, Chair, can that be emailed across to us uh, just for our own benefit uh, to all councillors? That'll be that'll be very useful. It's certainly a, a certainly a bleak outlook that we're that we're looking at. Obviously. For the time ahead, and I've heard some of this on the on the media yesterday as well. So I'm, I'm assuming that they've got some of their of their stats from yourself or or someone in the university as well. No, it's it's certainly uh, we have a lot of discussion and a lot of work to do ahead. And uh, I just want to I don't want to hold the proceedings up. I just want to thank Dr. McGuinness for his presentation, and I would like that copy uh, or sent over to us. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I presume that is uh, that will be done. Uh, Democratic Services will send that out to all councillors. Uh, Councillor Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And Owen, again, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I mean, bleak picture, yes, being uh, painted there. I've been reading stuff by Esmond Burney there, and obviously uh, in the same field as yourself, and the, the same bleak outlook. Um, of your presentation, uh, while we're focusing specifically Northern Ireland and uh, the and our own council within Northern Ireland, but your first slide was very interesting there, where you um, give those facts and percentages from the different countries. And the one thing that stuck out to me was uh, Korea, and I presume that's South Korea. How um, it it, it um, yeah. That's it coming up there. How how little uh, you know? How small there it is compared to everybody else. You know, Australia is the next one up, but it's about you know, two and a half, three times as much as Korea. How did Korea manage to to get a figure like that? I think um, we, we had a. I'll come back in there, chair, if that's okay. The, sure. the Korean experience has been was probably shaped by earlier um, the earlier pandemics, the the likes of SARS and the, the Middle East. Respiratory syndrome back in the sort of early two thousands. So they they pretty much had a you know when we were learning as we went along, Korea had a pretty much a kind of a track and trace um, testing regime already in place. After they had dealt with the um, as I say those earlier outbreaks, they also um, they moved to a situation very quickly of a very quick short sharp shutdown um, in terms of schools and colleges and. And then moved out of that fairly quickly back in with their their kind of the track and trace. But they had a they have a system there in place that I, I think um, could only be envied by other places. And I suspect it was that that would be the reason there that they were able to come into it. It was short and sharp, but it came out of it quicker um, than other countries. Other countries have remained within those shutdowns for longer to try and get the types of systems that Korea have in place, the types of public health systems to get those into place. As as you see with. Tra tracing apps, 
so on and so forth. Um, I think anybody who's kind of visited Korea would tell you a story there in terms of coming into our ports, temperature testing, you know, uh, contact tracing and so on and so forth right from the start when you land into the country. Now, now, that's very interesting, you know, that to do that. I mean, the Prime Minister the other day made an announcement that there will be a complete review or investigation into how the, the emergency has been handled. But um, if you have a country like Korea where they've previous experience of relatively similar problems, then they, they, they knew how to handle it. I mean, and inevitably mistakes were made probably in every country that that didn't have the 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 precedent to look at. But look, yeah, thank you very much for that uh, interesting presentation and, and nice, sharp, uh, succinct, concise uh, uh, slides there that give us a focus. I so thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Alec. Um, Councillor Corey, please. Good uh, Chair. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McGuinness, for the presentation. I'm just wondering, obviously, the elephant in the room here is, is Brexit. Um, and how how much has that been taken into account, um, Dr. McGuinness, when you're looking at this? And, and are, are we expecting this actually to be, to be worsened um, as a result of Brexit? I'd just like your thoughts on that. But thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Not at all. I, th I think, Councillor Kerry, you know, Brexit. When we're looking at the recovery, now, I suppose the the pandemic itself it has its own impacts in in this year. But I think when we look to the recovery, um, the uh, level kind of uncertainty around Brexit and the shape of that, um, how long the transition period might be, and other questions like that around the the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, those those factoring into the the length of time we expect the economy in the north to recover back to peak. Um, because I think one, when, when you're looking at the recovery, you're asking really two questions. One is how quickly will things get back to what you might call normal in terms of us working through our phases, easing out of the restrictions and the lockdown. The second one, which will become more important, is what is the longer term um, impacts of this and other factors that are going along at the same time, like Brexit, on you know confidence of businesses to invest, but also confidence of consumers to um, in terms of their demand. So we think Brexit certainly has a dragging effect on that in particular because of the, you know, there's still the number of questions that are that are there sort of floating about with Brexit in terms of where we where, what the final trading arrangements um, are going to look like. So it has it that dragging effect. There's no question about that in terms of the recovery. Okay, good market. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor O'Coffey. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, interesting slides. Um, uh, Dr. McGuinness, I, I, uh, I, I work for a trade union as an economist myself, so I, I kind of, um, it's it's similar sort of statistics. I'm sure we've all seen them, but uh, it is uh, obviously once again concerning to see the scale of the impact locally, I hadn't seen that, so it is of interest. Um, I, I have to say, I think that the COVID pandemic actually has only accelerated a crisis that was showing signs in the late of uh, last year. And it's certainly uh, exacerbated, let's put it that way, the trends I think that were already uh, in a way, I think being felt uh, uh, in many sectors. I agree entirely that we're facing the prospect of what is effectively a jobless recovery, assuming that we do get a recovery. Um, and I can see almost workplace after workplace uh, job losses uh, right across the economy, and, and it's what a, you know. You just if if you see the scale of what's held back, furlough is delaying the impact without a doubt. But in every single workplace that I I have an interest in, and that's pretty much most of them, um, they there is this has happened, and and it's just it's it's clear what's happening. Um, I think the other factor is that there is going to be rebound. I think the figures are clear. There's going to be rebound, but there's going to also be structural damage to the economy, which is going to have a long-term impact because it's not going to be quick to recover that, I think. Um, and I think one of the issues that you mentioned there correctly, the impact on certain manufacturing sectors, aerospace is probably the most obvious one in Northern Ireland. But really, one of the questions for me is, um, 
we haven't really put any emphasis on manufacturing in the growth deal, either in Belfast or locally in the draft one. And I think that that's a major problem. I, I, I think we need to put emphasis on manufacturing in a, in a sense. I think that the local manufacturing base in this area tends to be in sectors which are more primary manufacturing or else uh, more technical manufacturing. And they're not necessarily exposed directly to the headwinds of the immediate crisis in the economy caused by COVID. So maybe your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, there has been a cull of the precarious workforce, which you've got in terms of the uh, hospitality sector. And one of the points I think uh, it's not just an issue of an unemployment um, rise, but it's actually an issue of terms and conditions and wages being attacked. And I think that's another factor that we need to consider because it obviously has a demand impl implication, but it also has implications for working poverty. Um, finally, just in terms of the, some of the solutions. I, in the context of this sort of crisis, I don't think supply side measures, while they are very important, as, as uh, supply side measures are sufficient. Uh, the idea of training people up when there's nothing for them to go into, not enough. Um, it is important to train them up, however. Uh, so I'm really asking, what's your views on the demand, uh, so, uh, the demand side of things, uh, in particular in the context when there has been for some time now a decline in international trade uh, and, and investment. And you see the US, Chinese, you know, trade wars, you've got Brexit, you've got the European Union and all this sort of thing. Everywhere is the same. So uh, FDI is probably not the solution. So we have endogenous potential need of, you know, interventions. You mentioned interventions. What do you mean by that? And uh, that's really, so uh, it's just some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a couple of things there, um, and I'll, I'll try and kind of get round, get get round some of them, if not all of them. Um, I think I think you're starting, uh, Council Coffee. I think you're you're absolutely correct. I think one of the things was we were we were already at a stage in the business cycle in um, 2019 where we were sort of heading towards what at that stage looked like it was going to be quite a mild recession. Um, last and certainly, I, I would have felt this year, 2020, if not into 2021. Um, and there've been a number of kind of factors in that. I think, I think if you look at any of the kind of the business sentiment surveys towards the back end of last year, that was already quite evident in terms of little or no growth in 2019 and low expectations for what would come in the year to come. So we were already, you know, in in that um, place. And I think the point you make there about the kind of the, the two points you made there, one about the labour market. Um, I, I think that's correct. I think one of the other things perhaps to watch. In that is the levels of underemployment that we might see. So, in a sense, people coming back on reduced working hours who who would actually like to work more but aren't in aren't, the hours are neither available to them or or they aren't getting in the jobs they previously held. So there, there's a an issue there which itself will kind of feed into that um, uh, in work poverty as as well that you mentioned. The structural impact I think would be an agree I would agree with you on that in terms of the scarring. On that, the manufacturing side. I, well, manufacturing is is I think as all of us would understand is a is a key sector, um, not only locally but I think across the economy. Not least for the fact of the kind of the variety of jobs that can be provided within manufacturing at, ver at varieties of sort of entry points and qualification entry points. So it's an absolutely essential um, sector for that. And in the last recovery, manufacturing was one of the kind of key drivers of that um, recovery. Um, were how that kind of works, I suppose, how that's going to work in a situation where, as you said, demand is quite dampened this time around, will then, I think, depend on, on other inter interventions there on the demand side. I think you're correct in that public procurement will be a, a key part of that. There may also have to be, uh, I suspect, at least discussion, if not action, on the idea of what do we regard as kind of essential um, sectors within the economy. And essential elements of manufacturing that that aren't allowed to go to the wall. Aerospace, you've mentioned there. There may be others within that that you know we, we just can't afford to see. I think the the whole um, debate around the PPE and availability of that probably um, heightens or highlights um, that need to kind of take perhaps a more strategic approach. I think I, actually to be fair to the the growth deal um, locally, um, I, I would you know I, I can't really speak to the. City deal in Belfast as much, but I think to be fair to the growth deal locally, I mean there was a 
there was a kind of an emphasis there, given the kind of sectors that are within the economy in terms of manufacturing in, in Mid-Ulster, ABC and um, in Fermanagh and, and Oma. Um, the emphasis may, may there have been more on raising productivity um, within those, and, and that might that might need to be tweaked now in in the in light of what's happening at the moment. Um, but I think you're correct. Is it is that the demand side? It will be along the, the questions there of kind of taking structural strategic interventions, and, and also I think you know it, it's going to be a case of as the crisis as we work through the crisis and um, trying to keep people as close as possible in in education and training. Um, I know I know there is an argument why are we training people for jobs that aren't there, but there is a, a bit of a holding mechanism I think within that too that we need we might need to do in certainly in the the short to medium term. Thank you. Um, so we'll go to Councillor McIldoff. Chair, thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks to Owen for the presentation. Uh, I'm a supporter of this arrangement between the Council and the University of Ulster, like everybody else in the room. It's good. Um, my questions would be, uh, John, uh, on the furlough side of things, could Owen remind us of the key milestones up ahead, you know, end of July, end of November, you know, and the difference that that will make practically in the minds of employers, you know, uh, and then this, is it a tsunami or whatever's coming at us, is a direct consequence of that. And then it's helpful, it's helpful whenever Owen drills down to this council area for us. Um, we have a reliance on the public sector, I think it's mm. described as a reliance. And also engineering is a very powerful uh, in Tyrone and Fermanagh. Uh, engineering is very, very strong. It has been historically. What about the particular impact on the public sector and on the engineering sectors? And finally then, Chair, uh, what would Owen see as the role of the council or the FE college in helping to mitigate against the worst impacts of this? Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Michael Duffy, I'll try and do this. In terms of the timeline, really, um, what we're, we're looking at from the end of July is a, is a tapering of the level of support in, in, initially. Um, you know, so you you have a situation where, you know, from the end of July, some of the, you're kind of moving from the, you know, 80% down, you're moving that down. The percentages start to move down over the successive months um, down towards the end of the year where you're actually looking at, uh, you're kind of looking at pretty much the furlough scheme being run down um, by end of year. The job retention bonus that was announced during the week, um, I suppose, reflects that fact that by any jobs that have been kept on on furlough into January, there would, there would be a thousand um, pounds per job paid for those jobs that are kind of kept on. And then that, so at the moment, it appears that the the idea will be that it'll it'll taper down further, you know, the share. That the government will pay off the salary will start to kind of decrease fairly um, significantly from the end of July onwards. Our kind of feeling on that is that once you get into a situation, certainly in August, September time, you have two questions, I suppose. One is the length of time that if businesses are going to go uh, with redundancies, is the kind of the period that they need to give a, or like a consultation period around those. Um, so they, they, they need to kind of work that into any decision that they're making around that for businesses. The other question then is the if the if the demand isn't there come the autumn, you're then into a situation where business will start, I think, then to sort of consider will go through the ways that they normally do. Um, one would be to sort of see if they can reduce the working hours um, of people, reduce pay. Those, you know, we'll, we'll look at the terms and conditions, first of all, which has its own knock on effect on local demand. But then, shy of actually letting people go. But then, if businesses are in the financial distress on top of that, the redundancies will start to kind of pile in at that point. So, our, our kind of feeling on it is looking at it, um, Councillor Michael Duff, is that you you start to see unemployment begin to creep up from around the seven percent mark that it is now to a peak, perhaps of around about twelve percent, um, yeah. come into sort of November December time. That would be our fear of that because I think. Um, as that kind of tur as the furlough starts to taper out, thus people will start to be laid off in in larger numbers. Um, uh, and some of that goes back to the point that was made in the previous question: is the financial 
problems that businesses were already facing as they came into um, 2020 and the kind of the, the profit margins that they were facing at that point. So there's a, there was a financial pressure on there that will, will I think, impact on the decisions made. So that's on the on the furlough side. In, in terms of the um, public sector and, and the engineering concentrations and what impacts might be there, in the short term, I, I, I'm guessing really on, on the public sector, there, you know, and I, I would say this on, on the short term, one of the kind of key things I think on that um, will be those jobs will be certainly secure for the time being. I, I suspect, um, I, I don't see any kind of hints that, that that's not going to be the case in the in the short run. There is an issue, though, I suspect, and, and this kind of comes back around to um, your last question there. There has to be something there, I think, both within, say, council and other public sector employees, employers, of making it as safe as possible for people to return to their offices to work. Um, you know, a sort of a plan return to work for people safely. Um, because I think one of the, the issues is if you look at it in terms of the footfall during the week in a lot of local towns, that's down on where, where it should be. And I'm talking about, you know, towns the size of Derry or Newry or I'm assuming really on a skill in Aroma, because people are still working from home and are maybe people who say they then moved into, so say you're living outside Oma and you moved into working the Grange in Oma. So getting people back safely into that actually brings a bit of life and vibrancy, I think, back to town centre. So that is certainly one thing. I suppose the return to work protocols will be key, I think, to local local economies there. In terms of the FE College, um, I've been a kind of fan of this for, for a number of years and in previous presentations that I've done down, down in your in, in the, the district. There needs to be a serious, I think two things really need to be done really in a serious fashion. One will be moving the job centres up up a, a notch in terms of the activity that they can expect to come in through the doors, but also the, the types of job matching activities and mentoring activities are going to be needed there. And likewise, I think with the FE College, we probably now need to bite that bullet of, of under-resourcing that we've, we have seen in the FE sector for certainly you know close on 10 years. I think we, we need to kind of think of a serious retooling of, of that sector as part of a longer term kind of structural Thing. And that feeds back into your um, engineering sector. Speaking to engineering firms and the manufacturing sector in general, we have a, an employment crisis. The skills crisis for them has not gone away at the same time. So there is there is an issue there that we're, we're, we're still haven't really tackled that issue. They're, they're, for some of the jobs that they want to fill, they're still facing skill shortages in those particular posts. Uh, and that, so there, there's still work to be done on that side as well as kind of raising people up from the sort of um, uh, level twos, level three, threes up a number of notches there in terms of qualifications that we, we might use this to try and do do that simultaneously. Thank you very much, Paul. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so we'll pass now to Councillor Thornton. Hey, Chair, no, sorry. I, I, uh, my questions were actually asked by previous speakers there, so I'll take my Okay. Mind. Thanks, uh, Councillor Thornton. Uh, Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, Owen for that very informative presentation. I think that it's quite sobering, but I think that it's very much something that we need to consider. Um, I mean, I suppose, I mean, you know, you're coming from uh, an academic background, and I suppose I'd just like to focus a little bit on, I guess, uh, the role of academia during this crisis. And I suppose, I mean, I would have two questions, which is that following uh, the crisis in 2008, I always kind of felt that that was a point at which there was almost a revaluation of the role that economic history has a play in terms of uh, the overall discipline. Um, and I appreciate that um, in recent times, if we look at the Celtic Tiger crash and what happened in 2008, um, those were systemic issues to do with global finance and all the rest of it. But I would be curious to know if there is anything in the economic history literature that you can think of today that gives us uh, lessons potentially to be learned. You know, I appreciate that in your presentation, you've already identified potential su supply side interventions to do with um, sort of upgrading labor market mobility. But I'm just curious if there's anything out there in the literature um, 
that that could help us uh, guide us through this crisis because I mean it is in many ways unprecedented, but there is potentially something to be explored and learned from uh, from the history literature. Um, and I suppose the second thing I would ask about is that I know that um, previously um, certain academics, and I know that this would be the case with uh, Dr. Graham Brownlow from Queen's University. There, there's been a perception before that um, there is not a sufficiently strong partnership between academia and government in terms of Stormont and in terms of the role that um, economic uh, advisors and policymakers and uh, uh, lecturers could potentially uh, play in terms of uh, working with Stormont. I'm just curious to know what your impression is of that relationship today and whether that partnership uh, actually exists between Stormont and academic institutions. Thank you. Yep. Um, well, on the first one, I mean, I suppose one, the, one of the, if you were kind of looking for a key lesson, I think it's it's around, um, from the history, it's around kind of uh, the expectations and trying to um, get a, a sense. If you look at sort of the, the Great Depression back in the, the 30s and, and indeed even more recent recessions, I think one, one of the one of the things that um, tends to kind of stimulate demand is a, is a confidence there that there, there would be a sort of a pipeline of investment, a pipeline of employment coming along and that expectations of of, um, of the public as well as businesses then to kind of raise in a popular or, or in a popular or positive fashion. So I think, you know, if, if in some senses, it's really anything in life, it's almost like a behavioural thing. If you have an expectation that things are going to, are on the road, even if they're going to take a while, but if they're on the road to getting better, then that tends to kind of uh, assist with kind of consumption and, and other kind of demand features within the economy. So I think that's a, a the literature certainly would sort of point in that direction of the, the key thing of actually not only raising expectations, but then meeting expectations. So in a sense, if you kind of think of a stimulus package, a stimulus package that you get, you, it's not as if you get one shot at it, but you really effectively do. And the one thing that you don't want to do with a stimulus package, be it in Dublin or London, is to kind of fall shy in terms of the quantum needed, um, and, and that's that's kind of a thing. So, there's a sense that there's a a, a a major intervention and a major intervention that will be rolled out over a period of time. That itself kind of raises, I think, people's positive expectations of what's coming down the track. So I think that'd be one thing I'd say, certainly as a, a lesson from some of past recessions. In terms of your 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 second point there. Um, we're kind of very much in the policy centre. We're very much at that that, that interface between um, academia within between Ulster University and um, policy making circles, be it in civil service, public agencies like the the local councils, or indeed in um, politicians and elected representatives. And it is a bit of a I always think it's a bit of a three cornered hat or a three cornered ring, really. In in that in 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 some ways. Um, my view on it is is that you you you're wanting to get there's a demand I think for more evidence based policy making there be it if you're kind of coming up with a growth deal that you'll have an evidence base on which that is based but there's also I think a need there to kind of um, marry that with what what are some of the um, limits to what politicians and policymakers can do um, academia I think is is uh, you know, if it was to be critical of, of peers in that, I think academia is very good at coming up with um, a diagnosis or a prognosis of what the problem, the problems are, or the state of the problems, if you like. So to be a bit like kind of coming up and saying, "This is COVID. Here's what it looks like. Here's what the impacts are going to be." And thanks and goodbye, as opposed to trying to then think about what solutions might be posed. So I think it's getting that balance that you can move beyond the diagnosis of the problem to try to work with policymakers of. Here's what the solutions from other countries might be. Here's what good practices it is telling you there, um, and, and try and at least stimulate that side of the debate as well as everybody being able to kind of analyse what the, the actual problem is. Thank you, um, Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair, and thanks everyone for the for the presentation. I think it was very interesting. Uh, my question, I suppose, is. There's still a maintained focus and a maintained sort of promotion of measuring the the welfare or the wealth of a country on GDP. And I'm wondering when you see countries such as New Zealand um, previously, the likes of 
Bhutan um, moving to a happiness index or a, a gross national national happiness format? Would there be like, do you think the time is now, or there's a possibility for moving towards a different way of measuring the the well being of a particular country? Obviously, when you see New Zealand investing money and in services such mm. as those um, aimed at helping victims of domestic or sexual violence, housing programs for homelessness, you know, these things I think have recently or fairly recently been described as as game changing by. The London School of Economics and a professor there, and uh, that the uh, I suppose the New Zealand budget or the way they have tackled it, and this new standard or this new progressive policy is something that that no other major country has explicitly adopted as well. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts on I suppose that change of priority or change of notion uh, in terms of measuring how well we're actually doing as a society would be. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question, Council McAdee. And uh, the, you know, obviously in the current crisis, we're in the middle of, um, you know, there's a, there is a, I suppose if you kind of look at, um, if you look at a, the correlation between those countries of, you know, in terms of kind of mortality rates from COVID uh, and some of the other measures they have in place in terms of well-being measures, there's probably a good correlation between those who have handled it. Um, well and those who've handled it less well in terms of the the other kind of um focus that they have there in terms of budgeting and in terms of even measuring well-being and i think gdp is a gdp is a is a useful measure remains a useful measure but it almost has to be remembered that gdp is a relatively recent we kind of talk about gdp as if that's something we've measured since the era dot it's a relatively recent um form of measurement really from the sort of second world war onwards it's something that we we've done it has a lot of kind of problems i think anybody who's in the statistical side of things would tell you in terms of actually using gdp to measure even the national wealth uh, of a of a, a country's economy and um, because so many things now we you know household work for instance we don't include that um domestic work within gdp we have a lot of other kind of um in terms of new sectors and the intangibles around those that aren't included in a GDP either. So there's a, a lot of things that GDP now misses. Um, so even as a measurement of the economy, it's it's not necessarily, um, or its usefulness has become less and less over time. Um, I think we think south of the border, the problems that the, the south has had in terms of measuring its economy using GDP or gross national project product, product or gross national income or modified domestic demand type measures. There's a lot of measures out there to try and kind of grasp what's happening within an economy where you have international capital flows running in and out of it. So I think even within the kind of looking at an economic measurement, GDP has a lot of problems with it. It may be, it's a bit probably like democracy. It's the, the least worst, um, it's the least worst kind of measure we have at the moment. But I think in terms of the well-being, it points us in a, in a very different as a measure, it points us in a very different direction in terms of, which I think is going to be very interesting in terms of how do we measure if we can are not going to use GDP as a key criteria for doing things. So let's say you had a situation if you were doing a growth deal, just to go back to that point, if it wasn't just about increasing GVA or GDP or productivity, um, i.e. GVA per, per employee within a sector, if it wasn't about that, but more about measuring other Things like kind of leisure time that was used, or other other issues there around well-being, um, uh, levels of kind of mental health um, investment, those types of things that you could then be looking at, you know, a very very different set of criteria to measure what success um, might look like, um, and where does economics, how does economic success shift over into um, society in a more general fashion? I mean, I think. Most people would, would agree that we're only really seeing it's a bit like looking in the room through a keyhole and only seeing um, a quarter of the room where people all appear to be dancing and think, well, that must be a party going on there, where the other three quarters of the room, they may be sitting down doing something completely different and missing that. So it's a bit like that. I think with GDP, you're you're seeing a part of the the actual overall picture, but only a small part of it. So, yes, I think the well-being one would be would be interesting. And I think the New Zealand example is a good one. 
in terms of they're they're then using well-being as a criteria for budgetary um, decisions. Um, Jacinda Ardern there as the Prime Minister is making huge game changers in a number of ways, and I think that's that's one key one. It'll be interesting to see the program for government as a measure. Sorry. Yeah, no, I th yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think it's to to an extent. I think it is this continual focus and reliance on growth and the idea that growth is beneficial and it is sort of the cure to all our woes. But at the end of the day, we have to realise we're living uh, on a finite space with finite resources, and I think there has to come a point where growth has to be balanced against some of these other things. Um, but no, I appreciate your, your response. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dehan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Owen, for your presentation. Um, you know, the coronavirus crisis has presented us with uh, unprecedented challenges. The first challenge will be looking at the health uh, impacts on it. But in terms of the UK government, uh, their, their second priority would be protecting the economy. And to that end, they have invested billions of pounds in what have been uh, generally regarded as very um, generous uh, uh, packages to support business, to support the economy, including the furlough scheme. Do you not think, Owen, that um, the furlough scheme is really just kicking the can a little bit down the road, that we are really deferring uh, the onset of the worst excesses uh, of this economic crisis? Because it is really quite depressing that, you know, now that we're three months into uh, uh, the crisis and billions have been spent on, uh, on support for the economy and the furlough scheme, that now we're we're seeing businesses closing, um, and really not being able, many of them, to continue to trade, and this is particularly the case uh, with the uh, retail sector and the hospitality sectors, and of course, uh, consumer confidence will be at an all-time low. Young people who are known to be uh, uh, quite prolific spenders are amongst the people who will be worst impacted uh, by this uh, economic crisis secondary to COVID. Uh, so that's my first question, you know, really the, in, in real terms, the benefit of this furlough uh, scheme. And secondly, um, in terms of how all of this is going to be funded, we have been given to understand that the cost of these initiatives will be met through borrowing and not through increased taxation. And I sincerely hope that that is the case. And I do realise that the cost of borrowing is much less now, say, compared to what it would have been in 2008. Mm. Now that we have completed Brexit, um, what, where will the UK uh, borrow from since I presume it will not be eligible uh, to borrow from uh, the EU uh, funding support that it previously had access to. So I'm just curious about those issues. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll try. Uh, it's two good questions there, really. I think um, there, there is a. I think it's very true, Councillor Dehan, that the furlough scheme is um, kicks a particular particular issue down the road. I think that's um, now. On a personal level, I'm I'm not a. I think I, I wouldn't be a, probably as averse as most people do. Actually, sometimes kicking problems or kicking cans down the road when they're problems in in the, the chance of sort of coming up with a solution or a, a given time or indeed you know that the circumstances may change um, to make that kind of landing a little bit softer than it would have been had there not been a furlough scheme back in. Um, you know, had a furlough scheme not been introduced back in uh, March, April time, you know, and I think countries across the world were doing it at that point. There was a, probably a feeling there at that stage that, you know, governments were bringing in wage subsidy or furlough schemes um, at that stage because, in a sense, the, the public health 
the public health crisis around COVID-19 had necessitated shutting down non-essential parts of the economy and therefore sending people home um, or stopping people from working on building sites or whatever it might be in terms of the kind of the public health um, crisis that, that faced us at that and continues to face us, but, you know, faces in a very sharp fashion. And so I think that was the thinking behind it, you know, bringing in some sort of a wage subsidy scheme. The issue always was going to be that, you know, once the, that phase of it passed, um, what would demand look like when we came out the other end of that? Um, and I think there are two factors there. One that was kind of mentioned earlier was the, the state of the economy as we went into the crisis, which was in a... Um, not a parlous state, but a weakened, a weakening state at that point. Um, so there were already issues there within firms and within sectors in, in more generally that, that already existed at that point. Demand was beginning to slip off um, at that stage. So we're now in a situation where some of that is beginning to work itself out that may well have just been post a problem postponed. I think in the retail sector, there was an announcement yesterday um, of one of the kind of the local book selling chains there reducing job numbers there and closing stores. And they, they pointed to kind of a financial problems that they had been having for a while. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 pretty much put the tin hat on an issue that was already there. So there, there are issues there, I think. Um, I think the hope probably from those who kind of um, came up with the furlough scheme and now with the tapering of that is that enough time will be given for consumer demand and business investment to come back up to a point where there will be demand for the goods and services provided. Um, the issue there is, as you say, I think what are expectations among the public likely to be? Um, I think the early signs of that is that whilst demand is coming back, it hasn't been the surge in demand that was first thought it might be in sort of, you know, June and July. That isn't there yet. Um, so I think relying just on people coming out and spending again, won't cut the mustard and I think that goes back then to your re releases into your or goes into your second point around the fiscal cost of all of this I think at the moment um on the borrowing side of it 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 is a good time if you're going to borrow now is a good time to borrow given the cost of borrowing um the UK government the office of budget responsibility kind of pointed out yesterday that most of its um borrowing is still pretty much at sort of a very low cost on international markets a lot of their borrowing um, tend to be kind of on the sort of bond side of things, so the the EU may not have as big a factor in that, unless things were to go badly wrong within you know Brexit and within the economy more generally. And then, the, as we saw in two thousand and eight nine, the cost of borrowing starts to increase very rapidly um, when, when you have that. So at the moment, things look okay, but how long that'll last is 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 another question. My worry about the kind of borrowing um, uh, costs in time is that I don't really believe that for too long that tax increases, even, even under sort of a Tory government, I think tax increases won't be that far coming and how much that could further dampen um, demand at that point, um, I think is, a, is, a, is an issue there, depending on where those, um, where those taxes may fall. So there's a, there is a, a crunch coming, I think, um, towards the end of this year and into next year as to what Go back to the early point I made there about how people's expectations will be managed as to how long this is going to take, and is there a kind of a plan and a pipeline there to actually promote that and help that plan? Thank you for that, John. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Armstrong. Diana. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, my line dropped off there, so I missed some of that last conversation. But thank you, Dr. McGuinness, for your presentation. Um, I, I also was at the presentation at the Ardoan Theatre and all very clear. Thank you. And probably slightly above my head, but I want to bring it back to local issues just to ask a couple of questions. Sure. What do you see as the strengths in our local economy here? You, you've you've delivered around the various other council districts. So what are the where we can look for recovery, where we can preserve and and work for recovery within those sectors? And also, how do you view the agri-food sector locally in this district? Um, is that an area for expansion um, for, that we should be looking to support? And finally, where do you see the role of Invest NI in this district? Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks. Yeah, at the Ardoan, I suppose they, when I came to the Ardoan, Kieran and, and 
colleagues had me back there, you know, it was probably six months ago now. It was a very different, it seemed a very different circumstance at that point to be to be talking. Um, in terms of the local strengths in the district, you know, I, I would have talked that day and I, I would still hold on, on the idea manufacturing has to be a key um, strength. It's a, an unfashionable um, sector in, in some ways, um, unfortunately, and, and I would include agri-food as a, as a subsector within that. Um, however, man, the thing that manufacturing does do is manufacturing offers, you know, as I said earlier, a, a lot of jobs across a lot of entry and points from the very high skill jobs, you know, of graduates and postgraduates, right, right across the board. There, so manufacturing is a, a key sector, remains a key concentration um, within your within your council area. Um, and in the last recovery, was one of the kind of key drivers of of that recovery locally. So I think that's somewhere to to play to. I think in a, a sense that probably ties into you know the, the role of Invest NI. Um, you know, Invest NI's role being critical in terms of any export opportunities that might be there for manufacturing and other companies um, within the district need to be kind of pursued um, with with as much you know vigor as as possible. And there always are opportunities there for engineering and other manufacturing um, companies there. So I think that's that's one thing. I think there will be another issue there around. Um, manufacturing and other companies um, locally, and that'll be in around the kind of innovation piece. We, across the North, we tend not to be good, you know, at sort of a innovation within SMEs. Um, we tend to be kind of fairly, um, with the exception of some parts of the manufacturing industry, we tend to be fairly derivative in what we do. It's a lot of Me Too products, but I think if COVID-19 showed us one thing, it is the, the ability you know, and the agility actually of some firms to um, repurpose themselves very quickly to do other things. Once one market disappeared, another market was then entered into. And I think that agility, that kind of business model innovation um, needs to be supported very strongly. I, I suspect an Invest NI may well find themselves turning to that in terms of kind of how to innovate in terms of business models there. Another factor in that, which may be Invest NI, in alliance with the, the local council in partnership with the council is the whole question of getting, given that one of the nature of, of the crisis has been the amount of online um, businesses being done, is ensuring that businesses are able to operate in a fully integrated fashion um, online. We we have a lot of businesses with sort of web pages that are, you know, probably less than um, optimal really for the businesses. So kind of thinking there and investing in that. And I, again, I went back made the point earlier on the investment in, in rural broadband and in broadband um, west of the band will be kind of critical um, to that. But I think that online presence and in a full integrated fashion, I think is going to be a, a very important one. And that will kind of, I think, assist the hospitality and, and um, tourism sector as well. I think, you know, one of the, the interesting things is that at the moment, going onto a, a business's website in my own local area to find out whether they're open or not, wouldn't tell you, whereas Facebook will. So actually thinking differently, uh, you know, how businesses actually use um, an online presence there, I think would be would be key to that. I think Invest NI with, perhaps with the kind of enterprise department within the, the council could be very important in, in that way. Um, the other thing I suppose about agri-food, just returning to that um, point is, and this is probably something we, we didn't really recognize, agri-food was obviously a part of the essential. <laughs> Um, peaks in terms of you know delivery of of uh, food to the supermarkets in terms of the kind of um, processing in terms of the dairy and meat sectors there. Um, but agri food was under those parts of the agri food sector that delivered to food service at least initially in the crisis were under tremendous um, pressure and those pressures haven't fully gone away even though there's been a reopening there because demand is probably still quite slack. So again, you're possibly back to the repurposing there, at least initially, um, of, of some of those um, businesses to see how much that can be done. Or are there other export markets they could they can start to tap into if the demand locally is is weaker than it has been? And just on that point, if I may, please, um, that there's a, a local egg producing company has announced an expansion. And can you see in, in the situation where an agri-food business or a business wants to expand that there can be a relaxation 
somewhat in the statutory um, requirements in the timelines to, to get your approvals. Can you see us being able to work with, with the statutory bodies to get those ap approvals through um, where you have a proposition there, an economic proposition? And I, I, I suppose just to kind of ask there, are you talking kind of the are we talking food safety regs here, or are we talking kind of planning regulations? Really more planning, yeah, really more planning, and that you know, and the the sort of construction and getting getting the bricks and mortar up and going. Yeah, there, there has been talk of that, um, you know, certainly for ten years, and I suppose there there is an opportunity. Um, there is maybe an opportunity there in terms of the, the devolution of those powers um, down to local government districts to do more in in that space. Um, I'm not sure where the district is at in terms of its local development plan, in terms of its um, use of employment space, but there, there may be possibilities of, of at least ensuring that there's enough land there for, for zoning that can then kind of move fairly quickly into industrial um, development. It, some of the other regs that tend to be around, though, in terms of that expansion, tend to be in around kind of standards and, and other issues there around, so that, as I said, food, food safety. Um, export standards, things like that, which are, you know, probably non-devolved issues and, and are more difficult to kind of tackle. Um, some people would say with, with Brexit that may become easier, but I'm not as convinced of of that argument. Um, to be honest, I think that's that's probably not not likely to be something to hold out your hopes on. So, but there may be things there, as I say, within kind of local um, government control or at least local government and interaction with the assembly. Um, control that could be looked at. Have been talked about. Can, looked at. can you see more um, um, more powers being devolved locally? Yeah, well, um, you know, I suppose that was always supposed to be the intention. There, um, you know, one piece that's maybe critical at the moment, and it might be something again to return to, is the whole question of um, regeneration powers. I think that's a, a you know, if if we've, if we've seen one. Thing out of um, COVID nineteen, it's probably the importance of of those kind of local town regeneration, public realm spaces, um, and indeed other other kind of spaces there around sort of green spaces, the use of kind of um, running, walking, cycling um, tracks there. I, I I think are are kind of something in around that more general regeneration. Um, those decisions are cert most certainly best taken locally. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Catherine Kelly, please. Catherine, are you there? Difficulty. Uh, I'll come back to you, Catherine. Um, we might get IT on to you to see to make sure that you're okay. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Maguire. Uh, good morning, good Carly. And again, thanks to Owen for the presentation. It's it's very informative. Uh, the a lot of the questions, so the way I was thinking, are already been answered. But just specifically on retail. Uh, did did you find in your in your survey that there is going to be a slightly more detrimental impact on retail than the other areas? Uh, indicators are around the town, as you said earlier. Asins the, the have indicated they're closing their stores. That will impact on the town. That's one of the the national groups. But we also have local one man shop that have decided to close due to the impact of the COVID as well. Now we have of course meetings with local retailers. And, and personally, I don't feel any innovation coming from them, any incentive to 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 surpass, you know, the the difficulties that we're all facing and how we manage it. I'm just wondering, with your experience across the north, is there any sort of general themes or maybe stimulus or some sort of incentives we could use, especially in the town centre retail as opposed to the overall uh, the general economy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I mean it, it's a good question, Councillor McGuire. The, I mean certainly retail has been retail and hospitality are the two, I suppose that if you kind of think of physical distancing and social distancing and re re restraints or constraints on capacity, um, and I include in that sort of hospitality, 
those those three sectors are are the ones that are have been probably most in the front line um, of that. I think the I think we're probably all well aware in terms of the you know that that is unlikely to those constraints are unlikely to go away anytime soon. I, I suspect the the decision to be taken on mandatory face coverings within um, shops and shopping centres is probably a sign of that that you know. It's it's one of the sectors. Retail is one of the sectors going to have to live with COVID um, for the foreseeable future. Um, what what we found, I suppose, is that um, as I said earlier, the 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 issue for local towns, be it you know towns the size of Enniskillen or Oma or smaller than that, and, and again over my part of South Down, I've seen the same thing. There, it's it's the the weekday traffic has been slower and slacker than 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 it might have been. Um, might have been expected to be. I, I'm not sure with the, the lack of return to work in a lot of offices, uh, you know, working from home, how much that is a factor in it. But I suspect that it, it remains a, a factor. The other thing I think that the, the high street locally has is, is going to struggle with is that acceleration of a trend that was already there towards online um, shopping. I think if you, if you know, if anyone was kind of working from home over the crisis, they kind of the run of kind of career vans and um supermarkets that were making deliveries in and out of uh, housing developments up and down the country was was something to behold so that's a how far people will go back for, you know how far that behavior has been changed um fully or you know partially what remains to be seen i think one of the things in terms of the the retail sector those retailers that have um responded responded quickly um, to it in terms of you know whatever physical distancing issues they have it put in there has been a lot of kind of local support for people reopening um, again however I think there there is a kind of cohort of retailers there that this is probably a crisis too far in terms of reopening again and, and that was a worry right from the start of this um, was that you you would have retailers and I think any town up and down the country would have that where people have been in you know business maybe a number of generations. And this just seemed something, depending on the age profile of the, the retailer, this seemed something that is just, you know, like a menswear shop, so that types of things. This just seemed something that they weren't going to come back from when it was easier not to reopen as to, re, as to reopen. So that's a that's an issue in terms of the, the, the losses that are there. But it's also, I think, an issue in terms of the town centre um, look, if you like, in terms of vacancies and that. My, my feeling on it in terms of... Um, Retail in general is a bit like that, as, as I was saying there, that they need to be doing a bit more and getting a bit more online savvy. You know, and I'm talking here around sort of social media and other things like that. Um, I think that's one part to it to sort of be able to kind of do that. And um, it can't just be a young person's game that I think for retailers. But also, I think, you know, if I was given advice to anyone, it's not to try and reinvent the town centre as it was 20. 30 years ago I don't think I don't think even before this crisis we were going back there or that that had a sustainable future those town centers are going to um are changing and will continue um to change and the the presence of retailers on on that I I think is going to slowly kind of decline and be replaced by other by other kind of services other sort of hospitality offerings um that are there I think it, you know I think in my own hometown of one point you know, it's a, it's a very different town centre than it was ten or fifteen years ago. In some ways, it has changed quite dramatically in terms of its main street. Um, and I think town centres up and down the country are looking at that. This is a, something COVID nineteen in many ways it will accelerate some of those trends that were already there. It isn't the cause of it; it's just a, a cause of the acceleration of that. And I suppose it's being agile enough to ad adapt um, to that for those who want to who want to do that. On the one hand. In terms of supports, on the other, I think the fixed costs are the key here, really, um, and how much government can actually respond to that beyond sort of rates holidays, um, and you know trying to keep pressure on um, maybe landlords in terms of commercial rents, but or insurance companies in terms of the insurance costs or energy companies, but all those costs will then be passed on elsewhere within those businesses or within those kind of um, you know. Via, have a landlord's keeping commercial rents down if the same landlords have private rented property does it raise there so there's trade-offs here that you know are, are difficult are difficult ones um, to make all 
Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Campbell. Yeah, Gormy, I'll go to Carly. Um, and thank you, thank you to Owen for a very informative uh, presentation um, and for taking taking our queries and, and listening to our concerns and responding. Um, I suppose I work within um, HE and FE in, in my other life and um, I'm particularly interested in how the education can support the economy and how important skills are. And um, as Owen will know, there's been a lot of work in recent years on higher level apprenticeships, so uh, training people up uh, within employment. Um, and I suppose there's a particular challenge now uh, mm -hmm. for those people applying for HLAs, um, finding a placement, finding employment. And uh, many of these people have skills that they've developed. And I'm always impressed by the type of skills that people have and the type of projects that they work on. And they're the type of... Um, type of applicant you, you love to see coming really uh, because you know that they're committed and they're at the stage in their life where they want to uh, upskill and they want to develop um, but there there is that issue and and I'm wondering is there any room or do you believe there's any room for support uh, another scheme that would support perhaps um, somebody of that background who was upskilling or developing who who may not given the current climate find uh, employment uh, in engineering or maybe had employment in the past but that could maybe benefit from the skills of a higher level uh, foundation degree for example and who in the meantime could maybe potentially uh, start uh, their own business or uh, at least um, continue to skill to, to, to develop um, to support the, the economy and eventually take on that role um, within engineering or, or um, manufacturing. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. It's a, I think, um, one of one of the things that you're were, I suppose one of the things in the summer statement was in around you know what supports could be provided there for um for the higher level apprenticeships into the future. I think um there there will certainly I believe kind of have to be more incentives provided to to businesses to kind of. Well, in some cases, you know, there will be certainly more incentives need to be provided for business. All the businesses will take on apprenticeships, even here locally, um, and, and uh, you know, in various council areas. I'm, I've talked to apprenticeships are still open and, and being taken on as companies kind of come back out from under shutdown. Um, probably still see that as a kind of key part of, of their day and daily business is the the kind of development of further new skills. Um, the, the other side of it, I suppose, um, is, so, you know, for young people, that's going to be a, a critical place and, and incentivizing companies to actually do that, I think, will be will be very, very important, really, to make sure there is plenty of plenty of kind of support there for any company who's kind of, even in a, in a case where their demand is a bit slack, will continue to take on apprentices. But there is another side to this, I, I think, and that is in, um, and it comes back really maybe to Councillor Dehan's point earlier on. There is a question now of um, what do we do in a sense for, you know, we have a situation there with the furlough scheme and then after the furlough scheme tapers out, do we have a situation where we're under pressure to maintain jobs that may not return if you know, if you know, if you're trying to, if you know what I'm trying to say, it's the kind of question there, or are we into a situation there where we're, we're trying to have as much as we can to actually reallocate labour within the labour market into other into other jobs. So there's going to be a a, a difficult dilemma there, I think, um, to be faced by policymakers. And my, my suspicion uh, or my my feeling on it is is that um, it's it's a nettle we need to grasp. We need and we need to kind of think of the person in the middle of that who is the, the person who's maybe at risk of losing their job or has just lost their job. Of how to prevent that turning into long term unemployment or in or you know economic inactivity those are the kind of that, that's the place you want to avoid and i think the thing is there about as i mentioned earlier about um you know southwest college and other fe providers being able to actually then offer something that has a, a, a an employment based um and near to it i think the college southwest college is a very good example of a college that works very closely with um, business. Some of the other FE colleges could learn 
um, a bit from that, from the, the college there, in terms of that closeness with the local employers, and that might need to be even strengthened further. Um, there, one one place to look for that does that very very well um, is Finland, uh, and another one is Germany, in terms of where there there is a sense there where on kind of um, curriculum development, the local employers are closely involved in that. So I think there's a there's a need to formalise that particularly at this point in time where you're kind of looking at, you know, as I say, reallocating people from one part of the labour market into another and providing them with every opportunity to do that. So it's not just a case of losing your job and, and that's it. You're just down to the job centre and take your chances where you may. You know, that there are opportunities that are being provided to them. And, and I think the FE College may be one of those, um, will certainly be one of those um, pieces of that particular jigsaw, but the lead resource they lead a fairly intensive resourcing there, and as I say, they they kind of um, working with closely with local employers will probably need to intensify still further. Thank you, thank you, Owen. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Owen. I'll uh, come in. We are try. We're going to try our local tourism. Uh, we're going to try and promote a staycation, you know, for to help our own, uh, you know, tourism industry because we have, you know, it is uh, important to our district. Uh, also, there was a scheme last week uh, about, you know, eating out. Um, is that? Do you, do you believe that might help? Uh, you know, to safeguard, uh, you know, in the hospitality industry, uh, some jobs. Um, will do you think, in your view, is it going to be a benefit or a disadvantage? Yeah, I think I think these, you know, types of kind of the. Just I'll come back to the staycations in the moment, but you know, come on, those sort of voucher schemes, like I think it's um, it's a sort of eat out to help out type type idea of the Monday to Wednesday. So it's a kind of a. A discount off the cost of the bill on a mon Monday to Wednesday night. So, trying to kind of find evenings that are slack um, can be slack in the, the summer months. I think these schemes help well. I mean, most hospitality businesses, you know, they, they'll you know they may not open a Monday or a Tuesday night um, at other parts of the year, but at this time of the year when they're hoping there's going to be visitors there, they, they like to be to be open, sort of you know. Um, certainly through the week and a scheme like that that offers people a discount to come in could stimulate um, demand there. So I don't see any harm in that. In fact, I'm, I'm kind of keen on the idea of, of you know, voucher schemes in general that can be used in particular sectors. Um, there, I think, the, I think the summer statement may have missed out on the idea of a sort of a, a voucher scheme there for the high street as well in terms of kind of almost shopping local. Um, and, and that could be something that they may well return to. Um, in terms of the staycations, I mean, the district's quite well um, positioned for that. In in any case, I mean, if you look at uh, if you look at other local government districts um, across the north and, and across the south, um, Fermanagh and Oma probably hasn't placed or hasn't had to place the same reliance or hasn't the same dependence. Um, it has an international visitors, if you like, from outside of you know, um, outside of the island of Ireland. It has as visitors from there, from GB and elsewhere, but it probably hasn't had the same dependence on that as as other parts of the the island. So you're in a good position there in terms of promotion to staycation. People know um, know the district well, know what it has to offer. There's a there's a kind of a a, a sense there of having plenty to do, plenty to um, see. The problem, I think, with the, the staycation market, and I suppose this is the, the, the nettle to be grasped, is how to get people to stay beyond a night or, or a night or two. That's the the, the issue. And whether um, a number of councils coming together to kind of promote people moving around within a region, um, let's say Fermanagh and Donegal or Fermanagh and you know, Derry City and Strabane, a kind of a northwest um, piece or with Sligo or whatever it might be, is there something there? I think um, to kind of think of: Can you get people to stay beyond a night or two in a local area? That you know, so say you, you say you kind of go to an area, but you use, <clears throat> forgive me, your 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 council area as a base to which to explore other places, as opposed to moving on um, to the next thing or coming just for 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 a night or two, where there's pressure then on weekend 
lets as opposed to kind of trying to get that business throughout the week. So I would kind of think of it, if you're thinking in that staycation thing, it might be something that's worth kind of considered in the round in terms of what is there to do within the Northwest that you can use from Ananoma as a district to explore Donegal, to explore Sligo and the, the Yates country, to explore um, Derry City, that type of that type of thing. I know people kind of think, oh, we'd like to keep the money within our own place, but actually having people staying within the place is the key thing, even if they're going out for day trips here and there around the thing. So I think thinking in the round of what the region has to offer, as opposed to just what the district has to offer, it may well be something to think about. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, consumer confidence, you know, with the COVID crisis has been, uh, you know, undermined. Uh, it's trying to get the safety back uh, into our towns and villages uh, that, you know, that it is safe to go, it is safe to uh, eat and to shop. Uh, and that's what we, you know, we want to, you know, show that it is safe. Uh, and measures, maybe they're talking about masks, you know, to be introduced as uh, in shops. So hopefully it may be uh, beneficial. I think Kim uh, McLaughlin would like to come in uh, and comment. Hi Owen, thank you for your for your presentation and for your insights. They've been very, very informative and useful for us. Um, I suppose I'm just interested in your thoughts on whether there may be any signs of any change in government policy around the, the value that's placed on some of the roles in society. So in terms of nurses and carers being on the front line um, uh, and to the fore of this crisis uh, and whether you feel that those roles may be more valued in government policy going forward? It'll be interesting to see, um, Kim, on that point. I mean, I think um, certainly we, we, I think all of us, um, you say, who didn't didn't work in, in those sectors probably had a very different view of what was essential and non-essential by the end of the, the shutdown period than we did at the start. Um, I think, you know, they, and you could sort of see that um, I know even in my, my own local area here on, on a sort of Thursday evening with the with kind of applause for the health service workers and other essential workers and indeed the posters and so on that went up around the place in terms of supporting um, the NHS and that. In terms of whether that reaches, I, I think at the moment you've kind of had quite a lot of fine words um, on that. It, it depends, and it's going to depend now, I suspect, on what we kind of expect to see in terms of a greater value being placed on that, whether um, I think there, there, whether we can move from fine words into better terms and conditions within those sectors. Um, I think even, you know, the, the use of sort of agency workers within some of the kind of health and social care, looking at that whole issue there as well as some of the exploitative practices that can go on um, there for, for agency workers within that. So I think it could be quite, a, quite an interesting debate um, to be had. I suspect the, the thing is that the general public would have a view that the value of that has been recognised, but um, policymakers tend to look at these things as, well, okay, but is that going to cost me? Or what is that going to cost me? Is somebody going to come looking for a pay raise or or so on and so forth? I don't get that sense of that at the moment, but I do I do have a sense there where um, the actual, you know, consultation with people about how the jobs are done or work is done, that that needs to change very much. And some of the kind of reform agendas that have been put forward, which have maybe been foisted on top of um, what we see as essential sectors, it'll, it'll be interesting to kind of see how that will play out over the next while. So if you had a yet another kind of reform of the health service, um, you, you know, how, how will that play out in terms of trying to um, address the fact that we've said that the, these services and the workers are essential, you know, if they're essential, how far should their views be taken into account in any changes that are coming down um, that, ha that people feel have to come down the tracks in terms of those sectors. That'll be, I think that's where the proof will be in the pudding is how much um, participation there is there for, for essential workers within decisions about how their own industries and sectors are run. You know, I think this it's not all going to come down to pay. It's going to come down to that actual, as I say, consultation and participation. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, Councillor McIldoff, are you looking back in again or? Yes, Chair, briefly. Yep. Um, the possible second wave of coronavirus on um, how might one approach that subject? And uh, I'm just wondering, is government uh, placed to deal with business support measures second time around? Thank you. I think most of the thinking, Councillor McIntosh, on on that would be that the um, a second. Well, I think the hope is, let's say, that there is a a second wave. So the numbers start to increase on the back. We're, we're kind of seeing that in a lot of countries that have eased restrictions. So the numbers start to go. Numbers of um, people testing positive start to go back up. I think the the hope is that that then doesn't transfer into you know greater numbers of hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and indeed mortality and deaths from COVID-19. That would be the hope that one doesn't necessarily follow into um, the other, that maybe your tracking and tracing and testing um, regime, as I mentioned earlier, but Korea is a bit more up to speed um, for any increase or uptick in, in numbers that you would see. So the kind of thinking, I think, around the economic impacts of that, and this is the optimistic view, uh, I'd stress that, is that if that is the case and, and those kinds of um, responses are there and in place, um, then then a generalized shutdown wouldn't be as ne wouldn't be necessary. So in a sense, you might see if you kind of take somewhere like Germany um, or indeed parts of Spain where you've seen localized shutdowns there that, you know, for instance, maybe, you know, you would see a localized shutdown in, in, in a part of the north um, that doesn't necessarily have to generalize right across um, the whole of the region. So it'd be that kind of thinking. Um, that's that's the optimistic scenario, and I would stress that that you know everything you know the the types of regime that needs to be in place is in place, and that you're able to kind of track it, a cluster rising very quickly and deal with it, um, and kind of contain and suppress it again without having to send everybody home again. So that would probably be the the thinking there. Reason I think that that is the the thinking and the hope is that. Um, and, and as Councillor Deacon pointed out earlier on, the cost of the first shutdown has been extraordinary in terms of the you know the you know wage subsidies in terms of um income support schemes for the self-employed uh, in terms of all the business supports rates holidays so on and so forth so there probably is a feeling there that you know uh, economies certainly couldn't afford a long another long generalized um uh, shutdown and would hope that you know the investment has been done in the public health measures to stop that having to be necessary a second time round if the numbers do start to rise. I think it's inevitable the numbers will start to rise, but it's the response to that that will become that will be the critical um thing. You know, you've seen it across in England, obviously in Leicester. Um you've seen it in parts of Portugal, Germany, Spain. So i I suppose it's the it's the localized shutdown or indeed even the sectoral shutdown so that say, you know, um things come back through the phases more slowly pubs in the south of Ireland, you know, that aren't serving food, um, being, a, being a case in point there that the reopening of those being postponed um, for a few weeks or being put back to where it originally was to be. So it's it may be that that level that you kind of see um, in parts. That again, as I say, that's the optimistic scenario. I think we'd all touch wood that that's the case. Uh, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so it's just to briefly come in and commend Dr. McGuinness on the diplomacy with which he answered the question about the, the health service there. I think that was quite admirable, admirable the way you handled that one. Um, I, it's just in, the, in a follow up to the, the question that John had raised and your response to the, the tourism initiative. Mm. I think one of the regions that we could definitely uh, utilize further than we have been doing to date. Is the Sperrins area of outstanding natural beauty, which spans across Derry and Strabane Council and um, Causeway Coast and Glens and Mid Ulster? So I know we have a, an upcoming meeting of the Fermanagh Lakeland Tourism Board coming up next Tuesday. So I think that would be a good idea to to investigate how maybe we could promote and progress that because, as you say, rather than promoting the district, if you're promoting a region, and you can then extend one night stay into several nights, I think that's that's a very good idea and that's something that's, that's definitely worth investigating from our end. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Rainey. Well, <clears throat> thank you, and, and indeed, thank you to Dr. McGuinness. You have really been interrogated th this afternoon. I'm thinking just of a very mundane question, and that is the loss of employment. And one sector that I uh, am not uh, well, I'm focused on when I see it on television, and that's the airline uh, industry, i.e., first of all, perhaps the manufacturing uh, of uh, par parts for the airline industry, but the number of existing aircrafts that are sitting parked up in airports where uh, perhaps hundreds of flights uh, was the norm, now almost down to single figures. Is this here? Is it down to any a percentage of uh, leisure provision, or uh, is there uh, is it made up of business personnel uh, commuting? Well, it's different at different times of the year, Councillor Rainey. I suppose that's the that's the first point to make. You know, you have a, you have a seasonal impact there. That the summer summer months are obviously very very different for the airline industry than than elsewhere. But even at this time of the year, and I saw, um, I think it was a, I think it would have been the Foreign Affairs Minister in Dublin said it the other night that the numbers of planes flying into Dublin airport were down by, were about 7% of what they normally would be at this time of, of the year. And the numbers flying in and out on a weekly basis were down to around about, I think, 70,000. 60, 70,000 people were, were so you, you have a sense there of just tiny numbers coming in, coming in and out of the uh, Dublin airport at the minute. And I suspect other airports would be even, uh, could be even more badly impacted than that, um, like the Belfast City yeah. and Belfast International. So uh, the numbers there are, are very, very small at the moment. Um, much of what is, is there at the moment, it tends to be kind of um, for people, for Doing a sort of essential travel um, for either yeah. business or for work, um, people back and forth to London. You would see that. Interestingly, I'm told at Belfast City Airport, the only time of the week that it is seeing any kind of business is first thing in the Monday morning, and then a Friday, yeah. Thursday, and Friday evenings as planes come back in. The rest of the time, it's very, very quiet. It's like a ghost town um, up there at the kind of city airport. So, you, you, so you have a situation there where there's very little tourism traffic coming. In. Going on to the island, um, and I think you are you are down there to um, you're down there now to kind of two questions: Would you put an airline on if the if the capacity is so low that it you know how viable does it ha you know what does your your load have to be become before it becomes viable to put a plane in the sky? Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I think it's it's in around the sort of 60, 50, 60 percent mark. You know, with with physical distance and even with masks and so on. That's Difficult to do, but perhaps even more important than that is the actual confidence of people to believe that flying yes. is safe. Um, yes. and I expect for this summer, we are certainly we aren't going to see much much of that really at all. I mean, we'll see some people going on holidays whenever the kind of green lists and that of countries are announced, but it'll be much smaller than what it normally is. Um, and that that kind of raises other questions. I, I mentioned that point at the start is. Do you take strategic decisions on um, parts of manufacturing that need to be protected at mm -hmm. all costs? You know, nationalised, whatever it might be, that then they kind of need to be done in in that in that fashion. Um, that I suspect those those questions are going to have to be um, addressed over the next six months because I think certainly the aerospace industry isn't you know isn't coming back anytime soon. Really, I think the the demand for airlines will, even though it, it takes a few years for those to um, be delivered. You're you're now talking about you know maybe orders from a couple of years hence being cancelled now. Um, so you have a situation where the aerospace factories might be kind of finishing off work that's there to be done. Um, but what happens in six, nine, twelve months time? Whenever that initial orders are are kind of filled, that that's a an issue there for the likes of Bombardier, Thompson Aerospace, those types of companies. We have a big supply chain in the aerospace industry here within um, the north. Uh, I think that has to be looked at in that kind of strategic fashion. 
do the furlough scheme where, you know, if you're keeping people in work, uh, producing a product that uh, there's going to be no no, no uptake on, it, it, isn't very, it isn't very sensible. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it, it's that's going to be the, uh, that is going to be the question. Do you kind of strategically, you know, try and repurpose that industry at least for a number of years? Right. Um, that's going yeah. to be a question there, you know. Can but you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not totally au fait with the ins and outs of workings of of those and, and whether it's a case that you can, you know, is it like a super tanker that it's very, very hard to turn around? I, I, I don't, I'm afraid, Councillor Rainey, I wouldn't know enough of the actual sector to be able to say that. But I know it's a big employer. I'm thinking about. I think of an employer just along the coast here from myself in, in Collins, Collins Rockwell. You know, it's a it's a big, big, big employer. You know, of sort of aircraft seats for the aircraft industry, which is difficult yeah. times. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask if there's any other councillors. I think that's all that have indicated to me. Is it like just to? Say your name if you have a question. No. So uh, thank you very much, Owen. Um, it was a great, uh, great presentation, and I hope our questions and uh, you know it wasn't uh, too difficult for you, like. But um, I know that you were here six months ago, and uh, I know that the council, uh, the councillors, and the council staff will work with you uh, into the future, and uh, we will keep in touch, and uh, you know to do all the, all what we can for our district and to make sure that. Uh, you know those percentages of job losses that you have said um that we will try and keep them to a minimum and you know support our local economy as best we can so uh, thank you very much and uh, i think that's it Kim. yeah so um yeah thanks again for the the opportunity and you know um i'll certainly keep in touch with karen mccrory and, and the other team there so anything that's coming up again will get shared with you I yeah. think um, democratic services have the slides there to certainly share around. So work away yeah. with those. Thank you very much, and yeah, definitely we will. Uh, we may see you in another couple of months, uh, and we will uh, discuss more about this uh, going forward. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much for everybody, and uh, look after yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All the best. All right.